Welcome to Rough Drafts, how God writes his love in our stories, a podcast that explores the faith journeys of our friends and neighbors in Burns, Tennessee. Everyone has a story to tell. And in this podcast, we'll hear powerful and inspiring stories of how God works in the ordinary lives of people like you and me. Our stories are unfinished and perfectly imperfect. They are just rough drafts, a glimpse of what is to come because God is still at work, writing plot twists, introducing new characters, and bringing good even from the most challenging circumstances. Join us as we see what God is up to in our stories. Here's your host, Matthew Hyatt. Well, friends, I've lost track of what episode number this one is. I think we're somewhere in the 40s, but this is a Rough Drafts podcast first. This is our first remote interview, and it's with someone who is, uh, he is just a walking picture of the heart of the Burns community and the Burns Church. Uh, today's guest is a retired Chief Master Sergeant, and if I got that wrong, I'm sure he's going to tell me. He is a, a farmer, he is a friend, he is somebody that I've been on road trips with and stopped at gas stations that turned out to be closed in the middle of the night with. Uh, he is one of the best people I've ever known. He was one of our shepherds at Burns for a long time until he forsook the faith and moved away to another state, and I still haven't quite forgiven him for that. Today's guest is my friend, Charlie Dauphin. Charlie, welcome to the show. Well, Nasty, it's good to be on your show. Ha. <laughs> well, here we are. We've been talking about doing this forever. Yes, we have. It, it just couldn't get it worked out, and here we are today. We're going to do it. Well, I am super excited. And what a lot of our listeners might not know is that years ago, you and I did something that was kind of like this. Uh, when we would go around and we would visit with some of our people and interview them. Now, tell us about that. Well, you know, Matthew, we went around. I believe the very first one we did was Pearl Johnson. I think that's right. And uh, she was such an uh, icon of the Burn Church of Christ. She lived close by. And every year, she, while she could, she wanted to have a nice cream a party at her house and so she'd been well she lived to be 100 years old and uh she just loved the church she loved uh, uh putting on a, uh, the ice cream social at her house and so we we picked her and we asked her a lot of questions about her growing up years and and uh, it was so interesting and we uh I remember Anita, Bur uh, Anita well, Woodson, Donnie Buffington's mother, Woodson, Anita Woodson, Anita Woodson, uh, Miss Anita. She was, uh, <laughs> I can remember yet. We asked her one question Did you ever do anything bad? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Would you tell us about it? Oh, no, 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 no. no. She would not. <laughs> she, no, she would not. And I just can't imagine Miss Anita doing anything bad. I know. But, to her, it was bad. So, uh, and then we uh, went and we, uh, Francis and Oscar. Uh, oh, oh over there, right? <laughs> I knew it till you said it. <laughs> yeah, me too. Oscar anyway, Griffin, uh, Oscar and Francis Griffin. 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 Uh, they came to church all the time, and they were such a, a fun couple to be around. And uh, we, it was great. They had it. Uh, real hot in our house and I didn't know that my camera would do this at that time we did this on camera and all of a sudden the camera said hey, I'm getting hot I'm shutting down <laughs> the, the but, worst part was it, it was so hot in that house I thought you and I were about to pass it out oh I thought so too we had I, we had to take the camera and set it outside for a while and we stayed out there with it I think we, we, told we had to watch it so it didn't fall over or something but they <laughs> had they must have had 100 degrees in there Shoot. But anyway, did, uh, did we do any others? I was just trying to remember that. I feel like we did one or two more. Yeah, I think we did, but I can't remember. Those, those were the ones that really stood out in my mind. Yeah. And I don't know why we quit, uh, whether something happened that that caused us to quit for a while and we didn't get started again, but it was so much fun mm -hmm. uh, getting to know the background of people. And and uh, I'll, I'll never forget, uh, Oscar loved to, the lead one song i can't remember what it was now but he heaven he, will he surely be worth it all night. heaven will so surely what? be worth it all yeah yeah and i can see him standing up in front of the uh, congregation yeah leading that song and uh 
they were just a, a great couple, and Miss Nita and, and uh, Pearl. And I, I'm sure we did some more, but I can't remember the the other ones. Me either. But it was a, that was a lot of fun. I'm sure that you're having a lot of fun and enjoying uh, all the other podcasts. And I'm going to have to get in there and, and look at some of them. Well, you know what? Uh, what kind of bothered me a little bit was when you started rattling off those names of who we interviewed. I think every last one of them has passed away by now. So, Charlie, yeah. do you feel nervous about me recording an interview well, with you? Well, you know, uh, I'm going to throw that back at you. You feel nervous about me talking to you. <laughs> That's true. You are the one who uh, is responsible, so I'll drive safe on the way home, okay? <laughs> okay. We had we did really have a good time doing that, though, and I feel privileged that you called up and wanted to interview me. Well, this is fun, and... One thing that's a little bit different, um, you know, when you and I did those interviews, a lot of times we just interviewed our oldest members and we said, tell us how life is different than when you grew up. And and Miss Pearl talked about what it was like to work in the Red Cap factory um, and, and, you know, stories a lot like that. But in this podcast, uh, we've been interviewing uh, kids like Lila Kate Coons, Jeff and Liz's daughter, and I think she was six. Uh, and I don't know I how old about, you are, Charlie. Aren't they about, aren't they about my age? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Something like that. I mean, it has your age in it a, a time or ten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I act, Marcia says I act that oh. way sometimes. Man. Well, what what she's who, who's going to give her credit for that? Okay, uh, <laughs> but in this uh, in this interview, we've kind of been a little bit more focused. I've asked everybody, so tell me tell me what your God story is. And um, you know, sometimes that's a story of how a person becomes a Christian. Sometimes it's a pers- a story of you know, a, a trial in life or a, a success in life or, or just even the way faith changes over time. And Charlie, I've known you since, what, 2005, I guess, and I have no clue what you're going to tell me, so I, I'm kind of excited about this. Yeah, you know, all, all the time that we're on little road trips together, we never did talk about me, you know, it was too much. <laughs> because so, I wouldn't uh, shut up, right? Yeah, you, you did all the talking. Sure, sure. So, Charlie, what's what's your God story? Well, I guess my God story is a a journey. And when I say that, it's stretched out over many a year. And I started going to Sunday school at the Oak Park Christian Church in Savannah, Illinois. And my parents didn't go to church, but they took us and dropped us off. And the first Sunday, uh, from what my sister tells me, uh, and I didn't know this until just a few years ago, uh, she was planning on taking us to the Methodist Church, which is uptown or downtown Savannah. Savannah is not uptown, as you would yeah. want to explain it. Yeah. But it was down, downtown Savannah. Well, it took two of their four of us kids. I don't, well, my brother didn't go yet because he was younger. But by the time she got us, all dressed and ready to go, we were running late. Huh. So Oak Park Christian Church was on the edge of town, so she pulled in down there, and we went in and went to church, Sunday school. So back then, I can remember in all the Sunday school classes, I had flannel graphs. Yeah. Did you ever have anything to do with flannel graphs? Well, I never made them, but I saw them, and I used them. Oh, did you? Okay. Yes, sir. Well, I loved them, and I, I loved all the little stories, and I can remember... Uh, some of them yet, and I can remember all the older people that uh, that went to church there. And class go forward. Uh, and well, I, I'll go on from there. I went there to, for Sunday school for several years, and then I went in the Air Force. But talking about God, He watched over me, you know, all my life. I never forget one time out on the farm, Alice Shellman's tractors were pretty light on the front end, and they would come off, off the ground pretty easy. But John Deere's, they just stuck right to the ground. Well, I don't know what in the world possessed me to try that, but we had a real steep hill, and I was on a John Deere A tractor, and I thought I'd try to go up that hill and see if I'd get the front end to come off the ground. You wanted to wheelie the tractor. Yeah, going up a steep hill. <laughs> well, God was watching over me and says, hey, you fool. And about that time, 
the clutch started slipping. What am I going to do? I hit the right brake and pulled back on the throttle and whipped the steering wheel around just as quick as I could and got ahead back downhill and pulled the clutch and said, boy, why in the world did I do that? <laughs> That's the first time I could guess that I can remember God watched out for me. And then another time, well, <laughs> I probably shouldn't tell this one either. Oh, these are the good but ones. I, a friend of mine and I, there was a real narrow bridge east of Savannah, east of Mount Carroll. And I had a 57 Ford, it used to be a sheriff's car, and he had a 60 Oldsmobile. And for some strange reason, we decided to drag race out there. And that was a real narrow bridge. And we went across that bridge side by side. Ooh. That was not the smartest thing. God watched over me then. And going to going back to Sunday school, I, I I knew I knew that I believed in Jesus. I believed believed in God. I heard all those stories, but I I didn't commit myself and to to his to him. So then I went in the Air Force and. I ended up spending 38 and a half years in the military. And yes, you got that right. Chief Master Sergeant of uh, in the Air Force. And I always thought it was uh, weird when you made me salute at church, but. <laughs> I should have. <laughs> uh, you, you haven't changed a bit. Nope. So anyway, uh, I flew a lot. Uh, I was aircraft maintenance i was a crew chief and and that was the best job i had because i took care of the airplane had it ready to go and i took care of myself uh, but then i wasn't satisfied i wanted to get more rank so i put in for the leadership uh, in charge of people and that's when you like uh, uh colonel and i went downtown to purchase something one time and the colonel was telling the the local business guy, he says, uh, who we were and all that. This was downtown Nashville, Tennessee. He says, um, oh, he said, I bet those airplanes give you a lot of trouble. Colonel says, no, the airplanes don't give us the trouble. It's the people that give us trouble. That's right. And how true he was. But anyway, uh, I did a lot of flying, and I guess the closest call that I had while we were flying we were well there's two of them one of them we were in uh, we were in there flying in and out of Kosovo and and uh, all, all those three uh, during the uh, Soviet Union uh, uh, they kept the people working together but after they split up and broke away from the Soviet Union uh they were all fighting each other. Right. We were involved carrying, taking stuff, making airdrops, and also uh, landing on the ground. And for the life of me, I never did figure out who who we were helping because on the airdrops, it looked to me like whoever got to it first got helped. Yikes! But on the uh, the stuff on the ground, each airplane had five minutes to land, offload, and get the heck out of there again. So. Uh, we didn't have much, any time there. And, but one, the, I remember one time we got back out and got home to Germany. And uh, during the inspection of the airplane, we found where we'd been shot at. Oh, wow. And uh, it was, it was lodged there in the meadow about maybe eight, ten feet from where I was sitting. We didn't, we didn't even feel it, so. Uh, and then the other time we were going to, uh, well, we were on the advance party of when the people were going to the desert. And we were going to the island of Crete. But uh, we took off. We had, of course, we had everything, all the fuel tanks completely full. And we got up. 
and got up to about 30,000 feet, and about that time we saw fuel coming out, coming out around the, uh, <laughs> coming out, out around the engine exhaust. That seems like a problem. That's not a good idea. Anyway, we, uh, we landed, well, we were over water by that time, and the pilot kept on, kept on going. So we landed, and we checked everything. It quit. And so what are you going to do? We, we checked it. We checked everything out, and we could not find it. So we refueled it, and everything was okay. No leaks. So it flew again and had a fuel leak. And what was happening was uh, a rivet in the on the top of the airplane had uh, popped loose. It was not enough to see, and you couldn't see it because, you know, when you come in, uh, you couldn't see any fuel, any marks or anything. Yeah. But when you get an airborne, everything expands. Ah, uh, okay. So the fuel expanded, putting pressure, and that little bitty one little uh, rivet, you've often heard that you're only as strong as the weakest link. Right. Well, in this case, you're only as strong as the weakest rivet. Well, that makes sense. Well, that one rivet was, you know, when it got the altitude and pressurized, then it would leak and put it on the ground, and they liked to never found that when we... When we got it where we could work on it then. Yeah. But uh, they had his tear in there and they found that one rivet. And of course, everything is on the inside of the tank is sealed too, but sometimes that sealer breaks down. Right. But that that was that was scary looking out there and seeing that, that uh, exhaust coming out of the engine is about 900 degrees and seeing that fuel <laughs> coming out and the, the, Hot air just blowing it off the side. Uh, that, uh, that that was a little scary. I'd say so. But uh, all my life, the, the whole, all that time that I was in service, uh, you know, I when we had uh, Sundays off and we could go to church, sometimes I went. Uh, then I got out of the habit and didn't go for a while, and then. Uh, uh, a good, very good friend of mine named Warren T. Brown, better known as Chunky Brown. I'm sure, sure that you heard of his name. Uncle Chunky. Yep. Uh, he talked to me and said, you ought to come to, you ought to come to our church. Well, what's that? He said, the Burn Church of Christ. And so he said, I wish you'd come. So I was scheduled to go to Panama on a mission for two weeks. But I told my wife and, and mother-in-law about uh, that. So when I got back from down there, they said, guess what we did while you're gone? I said, what's that? Well, I said, uh, we went to, you were talking about going to church, and, you know, we used to go to church all every Sunday. And said, uh, we went while you're gone both Sundays to, to Burn Church Christ. And said, uh, you're going this next Sunday too, so <laughs> man, I'm okay. Okay, so they signed you up, didn't they? In the meantime, I saw Chunky. He told me he said about your know, wife was there, mother-in-law was there, and he said I, I expect to see you there this coming Sunday. Well, okay, so I went that Sunday and said, let me tell you what, I did not think I was going to get to go home and eat, eat lunch. <laughs> But everybody there had a had to meet me and and uh, thank me for coming and and burn church Christ was and now is and I hope forever is the friendliest church that I've ever been to. I I went there thirty three years and uh, it just I, I went as as uh, Jeff Coons said. 
they gave me an axe and a bunch of uh, stove wood to split, and I went to work right away. They put you to work from day one, didn't they? Went, went to work from day one. And that's the way to do when you get visitors, give them a job to make them feel important, and to get that way you get to know people. Some people slip in at the last minute and slip out the very first second they can. But you don't get to know them that way. And it's it's important to uh, uh, for people to be put to work and have them, have them do anything, uh, uh, just have them involved. So then I, there I was a Sunday school teacher, and I, uh, and I can I know uh, a couple times we we split and had uh, two of us together would have a Sunday school class, and Randy Fuqua and I, we just had so much fun, enjoyed. Uh, working with each other and, and doing the doing the class together, you knew, never knew for sure what Randy was going to say. You know that's so, what he said about you, Charlie. <laughs> I seem to recall one time uh, you guys taught a class from a book called "Gods at War," and each week you talked about something that that people tend to make an <laughs> idol of in their their lives. Uh, so you know, power or money. I seem to recall something about a class about sex that you guys taught. <laughs> I knew you were going to bring that up. I, I just yeah. don't know that I and remember I, the story, Charlie. And I swear that Randy took that book and scanned, looked through it real quick before I did it. He said, I'll take the first week. Okay, so I hadn't looked ahead. You know, I just went week by week, and then all of a sudden there I was. I was teaching about, I was going to have to teach about sex. And uh, <laughs> to this day, he he squared up and down that he did not do that. But I believe he looked through to see how it's going to fall out and who he's going to have to. And then <laughs> I'll tell you this: he he told <laughs> he told everybody in the class. He says, "Well, next week, and you know how Randy grins and smiles." He says, "Next week, Charlie's going to teach about sex." I believe he's got a film he's going to show. Oh, no. <laughs> Poor Glenn Buffington. <laughs> he looked like he was going to die, didn't he? Yeah. I guess he thought he was going to have to talk to Randy and I, but he never did. <laughs> so, uh, Miss Nita probably <laughs> talked him out of it, so I guess yeah, you, guys, probably so. you guys were all right. But well, it, uh, well, if, Randy and I just had a great time uh, teaching. At uh, I think he was the only person I taught taught with like that and that, uh, that was a good class and it worked great because sometimes when you're up there teaching you can get sort of uh maybe your your thought process doesn't keep you on track of what you had planned right so the other one can the other one can sort of tell that and he'll jump in and make a couple comments and that'll give the other one a chance to get back on on course kind of bail you out so, when you get in trouble yeah, so we both sat up front. It was one like we were up there by ourselves. We were up there together. And that was great, and I hope you continue to do something like that sometime. Yeah, most yeah. most of our classes are kind of like that these days. It's been pretty cool. Pardon? It's been okay. pretty cool. Now, you said something what? a few minutes ago. You said, you know, when you were younger, um, you believed, but you weren't committed. That was kind of, I think, the phrase you used. Yes, I, I, I've always believed in God ever since the, I, my first Bible I got uh, was Christmas of 1953. I know you weren't around yet, <laughs> but uh, I had just started going to church and Sunday school, basically, and we'd say church sometime. Mm -hmm. uh, my sister was baptized at that church then, and, uh, but I always knew that, I always knew that, uh, I couldn't do anything for myself to get to heaven. Uh, you know, you only get to heaven through Jesus Christ. That's right. And, you know, there's no other way. Because he is the light, he's the way, and it's the only way that you're going to get to the Father except through him. Uh, but somehow, I just, uh, I hadn't got to that point. So anyway, getting back to Chunky Brown, and they finally let me go home and eat. And then it was just uh, every Sunday we were there, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. 
And it was mm-hmm. funny back then in the old building, everybody had their regular seats. Yeah. And on Sunday morning, they sat somewhere else on uh, Wednesday, and yet they sat a different place on uh, what I miss Sunday night. Okay, Sunday night, all three nights. Right. It was Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday. People sat in different places, and you better not get in their place. <laughs> I know. And uh, anyway, one of one of them asked me, and at that time, so many people were related uh, there. And one of them asked me one time, "Well, you're an outsider. Uh, what do you see as our biggest problem here in this congregation?" I says, "You're all related." <laughs> <laughs> he said, "I'm not dumb. I'm not answering that question." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I found out, yeah, everybody would ask you, well, do you know so-and-so? Well, that would turn out to be their cousin or their brother or something. So I learned real quick to keep my mouth shut. Well, my wife now says that I didn't. (laughs) But anyway. Some lessons have to be relearned from time to time. Yeah. Anyway, I started, it was in June when I went to Panama on that trip. Yeah, 1982. And... Uh, the, uh, you know, I started, uh, Dean Freakley was a, the preacher there at the time. He was a, uh, professor at David Lipson. And I got to listen to him and got to talking to him, got to know him good. And we did a lot of talking and Chunky Brown kept talking to me. And so I suffered, uh, what I call the white knuckle treatment. Hmm. You know what ni- white knuckle treatment is? Tell me about it, Charlie. Or white knuckle syndrome. Well, every morning when it's Sunday morning or night or whatever night or Wednesday night, whenever they played the the uh, invitation song, I knew I needed to go down there. I needed and didn't know to go, but and my body was trying to go, but my n- hands were grabbed a hold of that pew so tight that I was getting white knuckles. That's right. You were, you were hanging on for dear life, weren't you? I, I, we, I was hanging on for dear life. But, uh, my real life, I didn't know about yet. Yeah. So finally, one Sunday morning, my hands let go, and I just marched right on down there and, and uh, uh, told Brother Freakley what I wanted and... and that I believed in God, and, and uh, I wanted to be baptized. So I, and I, it was in September, I think. So there wasn't too much time there in between when I first started going and when I got baptized. Yeah. So immediately they uh, put me to work, and uh, I think Chunky was, uh, we always read, uh, uh, we had a book for Sunday school, and we always read part of it first, and then we, Went down through, went through it. I think about the next weekend, next Sunday, Chunky had me up there uh, reading, and and I remember the oh, uh, you can think of her name. What's it, what's this, uh, Stewart, uh, Mrs. Stewart? She was the principal of Burn School. Oh, um, Eileen. I- uh, yeah, Eileen uh, Stewart, and she. Uh, told me after I got up there the first time and she come up and she says, thank you so much for getting up there right away and reading. But she said, I want to tell you one thing. I want to give you one little bit of advice. She says, a lot of us elderly people are hard of hearing. So you need to remember right from the start that you got to speak loud. So I thought, well, that, you know, it didn't hurt my feelings at all. Some people might not like it, but yeah. You know, I took it as a compliment, that, and I'm glad that she come up and told me because that way I could speak up. Yeah, that way you could do something about it. Yeah, so cause it, it's awful when you get somebody up there speaking that you can't can't hear. Yeah. And now that I'm wearing hearing aids, if I if you say something I don't want to hear, Matt, I'll just turn it down. <laughs> yeah, back in the good old days, you just had to, you know, ignore me the old-fashioned way. Yeah. But working at Burns was just, uh, uh, you know, uh, it was so hard to leave. Uh, and then we watched what happened after we left. It just exploded. And I told Matt, I said, you know, 
I t- I'm serious. If we'd have known it was going to uh, the burn the congregation and going to blow up like this and get every, you know, get so many more people, I said we'd have left quicker. <laughs> yeah, you you were what was holding us back all that time, Charlie. <laughs> I know. And t- to tell you the truth, there was a time at Burns that Sunday morning we'd have about 14 people. Sunday night we'd have 12 people. Wednesday night we'd have about uh, somewhere between 11 and 14. And at one time, uh, we didn't have any elders at the time. We had a uh, uh, men's board. And at one time, uh, they were talking about closing the doors and everybody splitting up and going to different congregations. And Chunky Brown and I fought that idea and wanted to keep it open. And so we struggled along. We even went to another uh, congregation in Dixon to see if they would sort of, if the elders would give us some help and advice, but uh, they did not come and help us. Uh. So we struggled along and uh, we went through two or three more preachers, I guess, and then we got. Uh, uh, James Inkle came along. Yes. And James Inkle was a godsend. Yes, he is. And then uh, I learned so much from James, and uh, he had good uh, good knowledge. He had a good head. Uh, he was always talking about people needing, the biggest thing people needed was a checkup from the neck up. <laughs> and he even wrote a song about it uh, for cr- Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> Do they, do you still sing that? We still sing James's song every Christmas. Jesus was born <laughs> in Bethlehem. <laughs> uh, and it was such a, I mean, he was such a, I remember Chuck told, my son Chuck told uh, James, maybe it's time that Burns didn't need a white-haired person. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So uh, James was there, how many years did he preach there? Hmm. I don't remember what year he came. It was 2002, three, something like that. Something like that. Anyway, he really did help the congregation. He was so knowledge and so person, uh, people oriented and, and knew how to handle things. I went out with him, visiting a lot, and, and it was so uh, great to see how he handled things and, and could talk to people. He's just and amazing. He was, and... I worked with Jeff Coons a lot, and uh, he was really easy and good to work with. And then along came this young guy. Uh, that's the worst. That was, uh, I guess he was supposed to be a uh, maybe two or three different things. He was supposed to be a, a, a youth director, I think. And I think he was supposed to be a, a song leader. And I think he was supposed to be a gopher, like to just fill in here and fill in there. That's right. His, his name was Matthew Hyatt. Uh huh. And that's when the church and of Burns just, just uh, really fell apart. He just he, he just uh, came from a different mold. He's not <laughs> what he's not what most people think of, about a preacher. But he was uh, he, everybody loved him from the little bitty kids all the way to the oldest person. And Matthew, I congratulate you that uh, you're still that way. And how many years have you been there now preaching? Uh, I don't even know. Um, I started, like you said, as the associate in 05 or 06. And I think I started preaching full time in January of 11. So I think this is 2023. Matthew said uh, when James was getting ready to preach or quit and uh, Matthew was going to take over, he says, now, James, he says, uh, you, you can sit right up front if I say something wrong or just sort of give me some kind of signal or whatever. And, uh, James says, I'm not going to be here, Matthew. Yeah, he got out of Dodge. You know what he means? What he means? He says, Matthew, when you say, when you take over, you got to take over. You can't, you can't rely on anybody else. I'm not going to be here on purpose because you're going to take over and you're going to take over by yourself. So... He was a little bit, uh, Matthew was a little bit nervous about it, but James took off, and it was the smoothest transition I've ever seen. Well, I told James I just prayed that everybody would live until he got back from out of town so he could do the funerals. 
<laughs> one story on Matthew. There's a couple of stories about Matthew. Uh, someone, well, the first day he come to try out preaching, uh, one of the congregation fell asleep and snored. <laughs> Matt just knew that yeah. he didn't stand a chance. And Charlie, when you say she snored, it wasn't like a little snore. It was like a, a comic book, wake the dead kind of snore. <laughs> <laughs> I was up front uh, teaching and I, I watched it happen I see everybody whispering looking at each other and I thought well I'm not getting this job am I <laughs> and then there was a time he, he, he put in uh, seriously for this job and I mean they had the grill turned up as high as it would go and they wrote threw him on the grill and rolled him over and over and he come off and he he, uh, he didn't even think that he was gonna put in for another pre preaching job at all and then I think hadn't they already talked to you about coming to Burns? Yeah it was the, the same weekend I interviewed at Burns I interviewed at this other place and good grief it was awful there. Yeah and uh, so he put in and went right to work and started splitting wood and and been here all this time. Well, Charlie, you might have forgotten about this part, but um, I showed up at Burns that Sunday night, and Burns forgot that it invited me to come. <laughs> so oh, I didn't know that. It was the night that Walnut Street's youth chorus was uh, oh, yeah. at Burns and the Young Men's Service. So eventually, it may have been you and, um, oh, Doug, um, Doug Jocelyn, I think put together that there's this guy that we don't know who doesn't look like he's with Walnut Street. Anybody know why he's here? You know? <laughs> and Jeff and Glenn took me. Uh, they're like, we're so sorry. We forgot you were coming. We have this other group here. Can we talk to you once they leave? So I kind of got put in a corner until it was all over. But it was a it, that's the sort of disorganization that has continued for 17 years. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. And then uh, one other thing, first time that Matthew got up there and was going to preach, good old Randy Fuquay, tell him what Randy told you. <laughs> As I'm ready to walk in the auditorium, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, he just grabbed me by the arm and just whispered in my ear, don't blow it. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, I guess you don't know this, Charlie, but we have a, a, a guy who's been with us for a couple of years now. His name's Steve Watson. And that's what he tells me every Sunday now, too. So now I've got two guys well, telling me not to blow it. Okay. <laughs> so uh, well, then, uh, it's always been an encouraging place. Anyway, yes, it has. And such a loving uh, place. And I remember when we uh, got ready to build a new building, Connie and Glenn, they were carried away when especially uh, Connie telling about how how loving that congregation was and, and uh friendly and all that and she when we were having our meetings about building the new building and what what we were going to get the new pews and all this she said well let's make sure one thing let's don't get above ourselves and forget about the kind of congregation we are yes and i always remember that and it's so important to uh keep that friendship going and keep everybody involved in and by, by keeping everybody involved, you're going to have more friendships going and, and getting to know each other. Oh. And getting to know each other takes me back to, uh, you know, we used to have a uh, Halloween party. We had Halloween parties down in Keys. And uh, then uh, uh, I'd always take everybody on a ride. And so I know that one year it was really a good one. We put a lot of work and effort into it. And, and uh, we had John Gabriel tied up in a tree, and he had a harness on. He thought it would be comfortable enough, but it was pretty pretty rough on him. But he had spray stuff that when I went under with a tractor and trailer with all the kids on, he'd spray stuff on them, yell at them, and throw stuff at them. And, and uh, then uh, I had the cows shut out of the, that pasture in the barn. I, we drove right through the the barn with a tractor and hay, hay rack with people on there and, and uh we had sirens in there and we had uh yeah those lights uh, and we went down and and uh we had uh john's brother partially buried yes down, <laughs> down by the pond and uh 
he uh we went by there and I says I yelled back I said uh, Leslie was on the front of the of the trailer I said Leslie jump off and check to see what's going on she, so she went over there and John's brother grabbed her by the ankle yes and she let out a squall we had a kid that was from White Bluff I can't think of his name he he threw down himself down the middle of the uh, the trailer and was scared to death. <laughs> and I asked one of them, says, does somebody come and help Leslie? And I said, let him get her, let him get her. <laughs> <laughs> Women and children they first. Keep, they wanted me to keep on going. So after it was over, we were in the house and, and uh, they asked that guy about it and that threw himself in the middle of the trailer. Oh, he said, that stuff didn't scare me. <laughs> and down her neighbor said, well, why were you laying in the middle of the trailer then? <laughs> <laughs> oh, those those uh, middle school boys are always so big and tough, aren't they? Yeah. But it, that was really one of the best uh, you know, Halloween parties we had down there. It went into it. We had and, some, uh, some good times doing that. Yeah, yeah. Now, by having those good social events, you know, it brings people closer together. Exactly. I'm talking about Don and Keith, they were always an integral part of, of our life. And, and uh, Mark and I, you know, went on trips with them and all that. And, and uh, they always had the Halloween parties. And, and Don and Keith, Don, uh, Keith used to love to come down and help them on the farm. He couldn't, there's a lot of things he couldn't do, but a lot of things he could. He called himself a uh, farm hand owl. Yes, he did. So, right. anyway, he... Didn't the Livestock Association make him like an honorary member or something at one yeah, point? Yeah, it sure did. And uh, and they always gave to the Livestock Association. And talking about that, that's another story I knew that you probably wouldn't forget. Uh, the Livestock Association tried to raise money for scholarships and stuff for youth getting out of school and going to college. So we had uh, state sandwich cookouts and we invited uh, uh, Matt to come to one of those one time. So I don't know whether Matthew couldn't say Dixon County Livestock Association or what, but he nicknamed them the Dixon County Cow People. <laughs> I just never could remember the right name because I it seems like some people call them the Cattlemen's Club, and some people it was the Livestock Association, and that was just a mouthful. So, I, yeah, Dixon County Cow People. Yeah. And by so the way, was, Charlie, uh, that, I, I had that steak sandwich for lunch uh, uh, two Fridays ago. They're still doing that fundraiser. Oh, are they? Well, good. They, they were really good sandwiches, and I guess they still are. They are. The price has gone up since you and I did it. But... I'm mad. How much are they now? Uh, it was still a pretty good deal. I think it was $15 for your box lunch. Oh, and... yeah. That we was, 10, I think. Uh, you know, you still got a drink and maybe some chips and some some sautéed onions and mushrooms or something like that. Yeah. Well, anyway, I don't know how much time you're going to allow, but... Uh, well, I got a we, couple uh, more questions for you if you got it. Oh, okay. So let's talk about um, uh, your friendship with Keith and Donna. Uh, Keith was a legend at Burns uh, for a variety of reasons, but a lot of our people today... Uh, I mean, you've been gone to Illinois. How long has it been since you moved from Burns up there? Seven years this past April. Seven years. The, um, the only reason we moved was my family was falling apart up here. Yeah. And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it. Marcia and I, uh, I knew Marcia had wanted to, you know, go home, go back to Illinois. She thought she'd see her, her kids more often. And, uh, but she, she got attached to the barns too and yeah so then my brother my two brother-in-laws were uh, getting real sick so and my sister uh, got bucked off a horse and landed right on her head and, uh. and everything was just falling apart and it was so hard because we absolutely loved burdens tennessee and and the area and the people and the church and so but god told us that we needed to go up and and help so we packed everything up and moved out and we come up here and it was no time my two brothers-in-law passed away uh my sister improved quite a little bit but she still has a problem with them then my youngest my younger brother 
Well, I have one brother. He was four years younger than me. His wife was younger than him, and she came down with cancer, uh, and we lost her. And then it wasn't no time, maybe five or six months. Uh, he came down with cancer. Yikes! And we lost him. And but I did get to work with him every day, and and when he got so bad, I. Uh, I was doing all the work, taking care of livestock and everything, and I'd go in and talk to him, and I still didn't realize how bad off he was until uh, one day he told me, he said, I think I'm going to sell cattle not have any cattle next year. I thought he, he could just cut down. So now I got other things I'd like to do, and I guess that was his way of telling me that, that he wasn't going to make it. Yeah. And, uh, so then that was such a huge loss. Uh I was, you know, losing both of them. And we lost, and then we lost Chuck, and we lost uh, five, and, and Marcia one her favorite uncle. But they all passed away in 11 months' time, five of them. And so we didn't have time to grieve the, more than the first one, let alone all of them. Yeah. So we packed up, and, well, we moved before Chuck passed away, but uh, moved up here. And tried to find a church. Uh, one church pastor knew that we were coming, but uh, we stood stood out like sore thumb because I think there was only ten or eleven people there, and we were newbie. Nobody, not one person spoke to us. Uh. So then uh, we went to the congregation. They were in a new building, but the same congregation. Of where I went when I was a kid, the uh, first Christian church. I mean, the oh. Oak Park Christian Church. Well, Oak, there's a city in by Chicago called Oak Park. So somewhere they were all the time getting mixed up, getting mail from the other place and all this. And yeah. So they changed their name, and I think something happened in mid 60s uh, between uh, Christian Church and uh, Church of Christ or something. Anyway, then they became a not church, Christian church. The Christian uh, Christian church, I think they had a, some people broke away, and I think they were called themselves a Bible church. Gotcha. So that's what this congregation now called. There's still a few of them living that were there when I was a kid. Uh, oh. So it's a real small congregation, but it was it is not as friendly as burned by a long shot. So Marcia and I have went about to make sure that we greeted everybody every Sunday and especially the, the newbies. And we went through our, our minister got uh, cancer and he was real bad off. Then he retired and we went two years with the fill-ins. And, uh, You've even preached you know, a couple of times through here, haven't you? I did. I did. But have and, they uh, have they had your lead singing, Charlie? No. Now, tell me about uh, there was a time when the that one of the ladies decided we need a song leading class at Burns. Uh, uh well many some of you probably know Kenny Gibbs. And Kenny was a regular song leader and I was his fill in when he had to work on Sunday. Well, if Kenny and I had if you know what a number two tub is. If Kenny and I had the handles on each side, we couldn't carry a note that between two of us. <laughs> well, anyway, this one lady said that uh, she had a grass. One day she wanted to talk to us. So she took us back in the little back, back room there, and she had this little graph, two graphs made up for us to look at, and two of those, what do you call them, sound pipes or whatever? Uh, pitch pipes. Pitch pipes. And she gave each one of us one, and each each one of us that little graph. She told us she she wanted us practicing, and because we needed to learn how to sing, lead singing. But anyway, all all we knew to do was blow on that thing. It, it didn't mean anything to us. <laughs> we didn't know anything. The first thing about music. So when it, by well, on a while, we didn't improve. So one Sunday she said. I want that sound pipe back. Pitch pipe. I want that pitch pipe back. Well, I couldn't find mine. I, so she asked Kenny. Kenny said, I know exactly where it's at. 
So he, he brought it back in. She hounded me for two or three months wanting that pit pipe, and I could not remember where I put it. But anyway, later on, she was in the nursing home, and I found it. So her daughter went there, so I took it to her, and I asked her, I said, your mother wanted this back real bad because she was going to teach Kenny and I how to lead singing. Well, I said, here it is. you want that? She said, no, I don't want that. <laughs> so, she, she had given up on you, hadn't she? Yeah. So, so I remember another time you and I were at the nursing home together, and we were visiting Miss Louise Dormer. Um, and she had pretty bad Alzheimer's at the time. Do you remember this? I do. And uh, she was, she was in that stage where she really had lost pretty much all of her, all of her ability to, to think and have conversation and recognize people, especially people like, you know, you and me that weren't immediate family or anything. I remember she was, <laughs> she was cuddling this stuffed animal cat, but we talked to her, you know, how's your day? And she, she hadn't responded to pretty much anything either you or me said. And all of a sudden, just from the silence, her her hand kind of starts lifting up out of the bed, and she she sticks out a finger. Her hand's just super shaky, and it just points to my belly. And she looks at me and says, "You're sure getting fat." <laughs> and, and you're over there next to me, dying laughing, watching while I'm trying to figure out what to say to her. And then that little hand just shakes from my belly to yours. <laughs> And says, <laughs> kind of like him. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> uh, I can't remember if we told that story at her funeral or not, but we probably should have. <laughs> she was a sweet lady, but those diseases yeah, are She was. Are and sure she tough. was a super good cook. Mm. And, and she and know, uh, her husband, Jim, were both as deaf as they could come in those last few years. And you'd go, you could talk to them, but they would each have their own separate conversation with you because neither of them could hear the other one. Yeah, and uh, I'll never forget Jim uh, bought him a new uh, one of his mini tillers. He wanted to show it to me. That thing got away from him and went right up his blue jeans, you know. And oh, he, he pulled up his pant leg. It, it ate his shin bone up. E. <laughs> uh, but she was a super good uh, cook, and she was always the first. They were always the first ones to go to visitation when somebody passed away. I don't know and that they, I ever went they, to the funeral home and didn't see them. They were always there. And they'd always have food, you know, and uh it was just they were they were great people. And I got a I had an old table that belonged to my uh great I guess it would have been my great grandmother. It's a round uh table at the top, you know, it's uh uh oh you know it's not smooth, it's uh, where they did design work on it oh, okay and it had the, the ball and claw uh on the bottom for the for the leg and it it had all it had probably 10 or 11 coats of paint on it and lacquer and all this and, but i never did do anything to it well uh they they'd been up to the house visiting several times they saw it and they were marveling about how nice that table would be looking good i said yeah i said i know i should have could have redone it but i never did well, I went on a two-week uh, trip, mission trip. And, uh, I got when I got back, my sweet corn was in, and so I went out there and picking sweet corn, taking it here and there, and I took some down to them. They were out in the back yard, back porch, working on on a table. You know, I didn't pay much attention. I got you some sweet corn. They they looked at me like, oh, ah, uh, ah, uh, and I thought well, they. They sure look funny. Yeah. So anyway, uh, she said, well, let's take that in here. And, and so I took the sweet corn in, and I talked to them about a half an hour and left. And I got home, and I said, boy, they sure look, act a little bit different. But anyway, the next day, they came and brought my table back. And I didn't even, <laughs> didn't even realize that it was my table they were working on. They stole and your they table, said, and you nearly caught them. Yeah, and they cleaned that all the way, you know, uh, redid it all, and it was just absolutely beautiful. That's so cool. And it, it is to this day. Yeah, you and I went on some other visits too, and we, uh, we had some adventures. We did, and then uh, I'll never forget the uh, trip that uh, Keith's mother was in the hospital down at uh, um, Augusta. That's in right, in Georgia. Yes, yeah. 
they arrived, I guess they arrived on the border. He was in the hospital. Anyway, we went down to, to visit, uh, her, see her and the visit key. And uh, the sister, they were all at the hospital. We walked down and we were looking for a room and we passed it. She looked, I mean, uh, Keith looked up and said, Oh, I hope you guys sure they look like, they sure look like Charlie and Matt. <laughs> and so we turned around and come back and, and stuck our heads in there and they couldn't believe that we'd driven all the way down there. And we talked nonstop from the time we left Burns to the time we got back. That was a long and day. We, uh, yeah, that was a long day. And they were so glad to see us. And talking about Don and Keith, they they were they were such part of our lives. You know, I, uh, she tried to raise a little garden on her hillside and said, you know, why don't you just whatever you want to plant, plant it in our garden and and you can come on if you want to come and help on it. And so she'd leave work and she'd get out there on those hot days and be pulling weeds. And she said it was, a, it was a relaxing to her to, to get out and work in the garden like that after being at work all day long. Yeah. Arguing with people. But they were very much a part of our lives and we, we loved them to death. And, uh, so anyway, uh, so anyway, we got back up here and we are now uh, going to this Savannah Bible Church and pretty much the best I can understand it believes everything just about like Bourbon Church Christ and uh, I'm an elder there I didn't realize that congratulations well thank you or I'm sorry whichever one feels more appropriate (laughs) yeah there's just two of us and uh, so anyway it's a it's a it's growing we we March and I try to get around every Sunday and and greet everybody and and uh, I think it's wearing off on people and uh, that more people to talk. You know, it's uh, they get up there getting ready to to start, and it's getting now to where you have to say it a couple times because people are talking. You know, like Burns is. Yes. Unless they quit. <laughs> well, there's a reason we start service every week with a song. It's the only way you can get people to shut up, <laughs> and you yeah. know, uh, it lets people kind of finish up the conversations before uh, before we really get going. So. Uh, it's a good problem you don't to have. have. To ring a bell. Uh, I do have a gavel. I just try not to use it. Oh, okay. Uh, Joe uh, Joe Markin made that for me a long time ago. Yeah, he he made some real nice little uh, 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 cabinets. I guess you'd call them on on wheels. Yes, for Martha, and he he was just so good at making stuff like that. Hmm. Well, Charlie, well, this Martin's has been a classmate made her a real nice gavel in school. That's right. Well, thanks so much for having this conversation and letting us do this podcast. Uh, are there any other stories you want to make sure you get to tell? Well, I probably should have told some that I shouldn't have, but <laughs> anyway, they were part of my life, and uh, I could probably tell the one on, on you, because you hinted about it anyway. <laughs> but uh, I'll just uh, let people guess. And uh, Well, I mean, what happens at 8.40 at 1 in the morning stays on 8.40 at 1 in the morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think that's a reasonable uh, description of that story. It's, that it's when a man's got to go, a man's got to go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, friends, thank you so much for listening to our episode today. You know where to find the show, and I hope that you'll share it with a friend if you find it helpful. And I sure look forward to hearing what God is up to in your story next time. Thanks for listening to Rough Drafts. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. While you're at it, help us spread the word by leaving a rating and review. Until next time, let's keep looking for how God writes his love into our stories.